and I'll be your host today. Um, before we start, can I check if all of you can hear me well? If yes, please type yes or okay in the chat box. Thanks, uh, so we are good to start. Okay, um, this free webinar series held by VUS with the participation of ELT experts and invited speakers from well-known publishing houses, such as uh, Oxford University Press, Macmillan Education, National Geographic Learning and Cambridge Assessment English. We hope to bring you the most updated and practical teaching methods and techniques so that you can teach your class more effectively, especially during this coronavirus pandemic. So thank you for joining us in today's webinar, Advancing Learning, How Do We Take Our Course Books Activities Online? Presented by Mr. Derek Spafford from Macmillan Education. Before we start, uh, please be informed that we will have the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, during that time, I will send you the links for you to complete a survey about this webinar and to download your certificate of participation. And now let me introduce you, um, Mr. Derek Spafford from Macmillan Education. Hello, Derek. Hello, can you see and hear me okay? I can see, I can see and hear you well. Okay, lovely. All right, so I'm just going to start by uh, sharing my screen for a moment. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing our screen. Okay, good morning, everybody. How are you all today? Are you all well? So as uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, my name's Del, or Derek, um, and I work for Macmillan Education as a teacher, trainer, and academic consultant. And I'm really pleased to, be, uh, to have been invited to speak to you today and hopefully provide you with some ideas and support for you to take your classes online or to uh, support you while you're already started taking them online. So as... Um, as always, before we do any online uh, session, can I just, uh, I, I can obviously, you can obviously hear me um, because you're typing into the chat box now. So that's great. So just to uh, find out a little bit more about you and where you're, where you're from, in the chat box, can you tell me where you are and in which room you are in? So for example, I am in my bedroom in Bangkok. So can you tell me where you are and which room? So good, good to see some people in the office. Lots of people at home, lots of bedrooms, living rooms, study room, that's good. Oh, Shanghai, okay, Ho Chi Minh, Ho Chi Minh. All right, lovely. And Da Nang, oh, welcome from Da Nang and Dalat. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, it's great to see people in the office. Um, that, that's nice to see. Um, and lots of people at home as well. All right, so before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my situation since this, uh, since this world event took, took place. So I work uh, in Thailand. I'm based in an office in central Bangkok. Um, and once the schools were closed, and I realized that I couldn't travel um, to do my normal work, I, uh, I started to work from home as I, I needed to look after my daughter. And at this point, we were fine to go to the office, although some of the uh, initiatives such as temperature checks were introduced when I was going into the office, and it started to feel a bit strange. Um, I started to work from home looking like this, and... Four weeks later, I now look like this. So there's been a bit of a change to my appearance, but don't worry about that. You, those of you who have seen me at VUST so will recognize me in the first picture. But who knows, I might keep, I might keep this, uh, this new look. I don't know. Anyway, at the start of working uh, from home, it took some, some getting used to, uh, as I'm sure you found out for yourselves. Um, I'm lucky that... Um, 
like e even though I have a family, my daughter is is 13, so she requires very little in terms of looking after. And uh, even at this time now, which is what 10 o'clock, she's still in bed. So uh, there's no there's no worries there in terms of looking after her. But I need to establish rules, and this is something that I I'm sure that you've done, or that if you haven't done, it's very important to establish some rules so that you can differentiate between work and home and work and relax. I found in the first week that it was very difficult to separate my home life from my work life. And to be honest, I think I was actually working uh, far too many hours. So I was, I was more of the time working rather than being at home. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for this. One, I felt very lucky that I had work to do at this time when a lot of my colleagues and a lot of friends didn't. Um, and the other is that I was very um, happy that I have a supportive company to work for and, uh, you know, want, really wanted to, to show that I still have worth and can provide something during this time. Um, so what I did is I decided then when I realized this wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go back to the office quickly, I've set up a little office and here is my office now and I'm very happy here. It's quite small, I've got my books around me, I've got my laptop, my um, my own computer, uh, so that I can I can differentiate between work and, and home, and it established me to establish boundaries. My daughter knows, and my wife knows, not to come in the room if it, if the door's closed. And I would encourage all of you to do the same. So, if you're using a laptop for everything, then fine, but make sure you just have one space where you work and you sit down and work. And this is your base. This is where you start. Separate as much as possible your work and your home life. So that's just my little reflections on, on where we are at the moment. And just to start off our session, I'm just going to have a look at this for. I would like us to have a look at this Mentimeter and add our thoughts on how we feel about teaching online. So you can reach this by opening a browser on your computer or on your phone and type menti.com, and then you'll be asked for a code. So the code here is just hidden by the chat box, is 481448. And I'd like you to give your thoughts to the statement, I am excited about teaching online. Let me pull that up. Okay, this is good to see. All right, so we've got lots of people moving towards the agree. Nice. A couple more seconds. Okay, a few more. I'm gonna count you down ten, eight, seven. Six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. I'll leave that open anyway for now. But I think just uh, it's nice to see. It's really great to see that we have a lot of people who agree and a small number who disagree that are not excited. Now, it could be that word excited. Um, you might not be excited about teaching online. But you might be. Uh, hopefully, you're not too. Uh, you're not too worried about it. That's what I want to. I want to say. And and hopefully, after the end of today's session, you'll have some ideas, and you might feel a bit more excited about teaching online. My uh, my own experience um, of teaching and training online is. Uh, let me just go back to share my PowerPoint screen. So my own experience of teaching um, and training online is founded in, in research, 
uh, trial and error and also feedback. So I've taken courses online and these courses are free um, and I'll provide some links to those later. And I've had some um, and I've received uh, feedback from sessions that I've delivered. And I've also been asked to reflect on these sessions myself. And these are great ways to make sure that you get better at teaching online. I encourage you to do the same. Also, I just wanted to share this with you, that way back in the year 2000, I participated in a, uh, as a teacher on a distance learning project, which was founded by the, the king at the time, King Rama Nai. And I went to a studio in uh, the seaside town of Huahin, and I took some students of mine uh, with me, and uh, we delivered a class which was televised, uh, sorry, televised and uh, shown across Thailand. Um, this form of distance learning, obviously it's primitive by today's standards, but it did show me how a large group of people could have access to education. Um, and now I think we have even better tools, obviously, um, to be able to reach people um, throughout um, our, you know, our students that we teach. I was absolutely terrified of uh, teaching um, on TV. Um, I actually even managed to spell um, desert as desert, uh, which a student pointed out to me during a break. I then had to go back on TV after the break and apologize to, uh, to the viewers. So I think um, being terrified is fine. And being scared to do something is fine, but, not, but I didn't make the same mistake again. Uh, and, I, and I think if you're feeling a bit nervous and, and scared about teaching online, this is natural and, and, and don't worry about it, it will get better. So in the last couple of months, I've delivered online sessions to teams across Asia, and in particular, Vietnam and Thailand. And I've done this, what we call synchronously. So you might have heard this technology, uh, this word before. So synchronously means, uh, means live teaching, so like face-to-face -face teaching, uh, like we're doing now. And uh, also asynchronously. So this is more self-study, so giving tasks for participants to do uh, between sessions or between classes. More like we, we would classify possibly as homework uh, if we're teaching students. And I'm still learning, uh, probably like you, and hopefully like you, I'm still enjoying the challenge um, and enjoying learning new skills and enjoy developing. Okay, so I'm happy to see that we have a lot of positivity in the room, that people are excited to teach. So let's, uh, let's move on. So first of all, I'm going to start with some quotes. So the first quote is from Donna Abernethy, or Abernathy, sorry. And this must be one of the most popular quotes in webinars and blogs online at the moment. I think if you were to Google uh, online teaching and quotes, you would see this, uh, uh, this blog. I'm sure it's not a new, uh, a new thing for you to see. The next one is by John Dewey, and this is one of my favorites. Um, I've used this previously. Uh, when, I, when I first uh, did a session at VUS TESOL back in 2016, uh, you would have seen this quote when I was uh, talking about um, 21st century teaching. Now, uh, I don't expect any of you to remember this, of course, if you were there in person. Uh, but what I'm most interested in with these two quotes is actually the, um, the dates. So does anybody know, or does anybody have a guess um, about what the date they think the first quote comes from? When does, it, when does it come from? What year do you think this first quote is from? 2003, okay. Oh, someone's out. Oh, oh, we've got some, some good guesses. 2018, 2007. Yeah, it's actually from 1999, which I think someone got correct, right? Let me just have a look. Yes, we did. From Hope. Got it right. Yeah, this is from 1999. And the, the, the John Dewey quote, when do you think this is from?
Well done, Hope. Oh, 1890, that's a good one. Well, you actually, being going back so, so far to 1890, we're looking here at 1952, which was nearly um, 70 years ago. And so what I want to get from these two quotes is, um, and, and two quotes that I really like, is that online learning isn't, isn't new as a concept and delivering lessons that match the needs of today and our students now is also not a modern concept. But for most of us in this situation, it is likely new. And it is something that's been very, uh, is, is really rushed up on us very quickly and pushed us in a way that possibly we should be going, but like any change, it's very difficult to, to navigate and we might be reluctant to go this way. Even some of the most experienced teachers that I know are finding it difficult um, and a challenge to adjust. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of people I've spoken to about teaching online are finding it very tiring, I find it exhausting. So I think this is something uh, to consider as well. What I would say though, is that students, in my opinion, are very well equipped to learn online and very adaptable and, and change and adaptable to change and are happy to uh, to embrace new environments. They're more suitable to change, in my opinion, than we are as teachers. And uh, they are what we call digital natives. They are born now with technology, um, right from right from the word go. As soon as they can walk, they can use iPhones and iPads and any and computers. Um, and for the most part, I think a lot of the teachers. Um, certainly around my age, uh, uh, what we call digital immigrants. So we learned how to use a computer later on in life. But we can be comforted that students then can pick up this new technology quickly and we need, we need to be afraid that they won't be able to get it. Um, my daughter is an example. She's a, she's a, a good example for me. She's recently started uh, learning online. Um, and from what I can see, that learning seems to be quite teacher-centered. and. Uh, Despite that, she's actually enjoying it. And when I've spoken to her, she's, she's really found it nice to be able to see her friends again and her, and her teachers again. And she understands that the teachers may not have the skills to teach online yet. Um, and you can see it from her and her friends and how they talk to each other, that they're happy to, um, to help and accommodate the teacher with this. They understand that this is a difficult time. And I think that's a really nice thing to see that's come out of this. This is a nice side effect. My daughter, yeah, she is a digital native, but I, I'm really what I'm really interested in is her attitude to studying online um, and her attitude to the way that her teachers are teaching. And like I said, they're very happy to, to, uh, to, to understand and cut some slack uh, for the teachers. So I also think on another and another point, and looking at social media, looking online, that we're also seeing parents and other people realize how difficult it is to teach and look after the, the children and the future of our countries. Um, there are numerous memes of parents who are wishing this would all go away so that they can give their kids back to us as teachers, right? So I, I just thought I'd share a couple of memes before we start. So this is about homeschooling. which I've kind of started doing and we, we're kind of okay, me and my daughter. I, I have a, a lot of empathy for her. And then we have this other one here, which I think is probably quite true as well. So it, hopefully it won't be too long before our kids can go back to school and they can, you can greet them at the gates and the parents are gonna be showering with you with gifts and love and understanding. Um, about how difficult it is to, uh, to actually do our jobs. Okay, so just a bit of background information about today. We're going to focus on primary for today's session. Um, however, I would say that these activities that we're going to look at um, can be adapted. So it, regardless of the level that you are teaching, please don't leave. Um, if you're not a primary level teacher, just think about how you can 
uh, adapt these activities for your teenagers or even for your adult classes. So what I've tried to do is look at a page of a primary course book and the activities that we see in a course book. Um, this is, um, um, well, I will show you the course book in a moment. Um, we will use one or two online tools that are easy to use and free. But I won't go into too much detail about the online tools you can use to make learning interactive, such as these tools here, Kahoot, Socrative, Padlet, uh, FlipView, lots of other different tools that you can use um, because there's lots of information already out there with, uh, with lists of what you, can, uh, what you can use these for. So I've planned this session as I would a teacher in a new environment. And I've looked at solutions for picking up a traditional resource such as a course book and looking at how I can move online with this course book. Now, I realize it's not possible to meet the needs of every situation. So for the purpose of this session, I'm also assuming that students have a decent internet connection and a laptop or a computer. I'm also assuming that they have the course book, um, but there's other ways of getting the course book to them if they don't. And I'm sure you can come up with your own ways to do that. And I'm assuming, so there's a lot of assuming going on, but I'm assuming that we have fairly decent, manageable class sizes. All right. So the next thing I'm going to look at is special needs. So in the webinar, I'm going to be focusing on a somewhat idealistic environment, as I just mentioned. But it's worth pointing out now special needs. Now, in this case, I borrowed the term special needs from an excellent webinar by Laura Patsko. Now this is called Moving Your Instruction Online Fast. And this can be found at the Macmillan English Distance Teaching and Learning Hub. And I'll show you a link to that later. Special needs in this case is not focusing on developmental areas uh, such as dyslexia or uh, ADHD or autism, but more on environmental issues such as whether students have access to a computer or the internet. They may not want to show themselves using a webcam as their home life may be different from others. Now, School Life tends to standardize this by providing materials that are the same across the board and also making students wear uniforms. So home life is very different, obviously, from individual to individual. So just bear this in mind when you're teaching online. What we, what we hope to see is this, but what we might see is this. And I think when I was a kid, I was probably more like the second image. So with most face-to-face -face courses, we would conduct a simple needs analysis before the course starts or in the first lesson, and normally this is, if it's a face-to-face -face course, we want to find out what the students like, what their strengths and weaknesses are, uh, what they enjoy studying, this kind of thing. But in this case, we might want to do a needs analysis um, with the parents to find out what kind of situation we have logistically. So that's just a little bit of a, a background into that uh, special needs and what you need to think, out, think about logistically. I'm going to also show you an interactive software tool. So this tool is linked to the course book that we're going to be using, which is called Give Me Five. The course book has digital software available, and this is such a powerful tool when we're teaching online. Well, I'm going to show you an example of the Teachers app, which we can use for synchronous live teaching. And if we have time, I'll show you the students app as well, which the students can use in their own time for asynchronous learning. The software is called Navio and all the activities are gamified. So this creates a stronger motivation for student success. Please check to see if your course book that you are using has interactive software. And if it does, make sure you start using it because it will help you so much. And I'll show you just a couple of areas in which this software can help us save time and also present lessons uh, much more effectively. 
Synchronous, you've heard. So just to recap, synchronous are tasks that are live teaching, just we are, just as we are doing now. Uh, students need access to the computer, the microphone, and the and the camera, and you have control over this. And we also have asynchronous tasks. So this is essentially homework tasks that can be done in their own time, set by the teacher. Um, they can record videos, they can write stories, they can complete activities in their workbook and post them online. But this is up to the teacher and also dependent on the platform that you're using and the time that you and that the students have to do it. Okay, so let's have a look at the course book. So we're using a course book here from Macmillan called Give Me Five. This is a primary course book and it's a level four book. And you'll see we start off with vocabulary and um, the next uh, unit will introduce grammar before moving on to some skills. So what we're going to look at today is this page on vocabulary. And then I'll look at a page uh, of a, a reading activity uh, to show you how, how we can teach uh, online um, these skills activities. So first of all, let's have a look at the learning outcomes. So these are signposted at the bottom and the learning outcomes for the lesson identify and say, adjectives of character and sing a song about what people are like. So the title is, what are you like? So the first thing we're going to do is introduce the topic and activate schemata. So activate schemata. We're going to find out what the students already know about the topic area. And we're going to do this as a brainstorm. So how can we brainstorm effectively online? So let's take a look at how we can do this. So we're going to do this synchronously. So we're going to do this live. We're going to do this now and we will practice together. So the first thing we can do is use the chat box. So the chat box is fine and it's okay I think with small groups. Now we have quite a large group at the moment. We've got 447 participants. So if I was to use the chat box for this activity, it might get a bit messy and difficult for me to manage what people are saying. It also allows stronger students I think to dominate and weaker students to just sit back and relax. We want to sort of promote um, interaction so in order to do that, there's a better way and we can use Google Docs, all right? So this is much better because you can put participants into groups easily and you can use color in order to separate the groups as well to make it even more, uh, even more easier to do. It breaks up the task and it requires more input. So let's have a go. I'm going to share a Google Doc with you. But before I do, I'm going to put you into groups. And we're going to do this by birth date. OK. So if your birth date is from the 1st to the 8th, you are in group one. If your birth date is from the 9th to the 16th, you're in group two. Group three, your birthday is from the 17th to the 24th. And group four, if your birthday is from the 25th to the 31st. So let's have a quick check. In the chat box, can you type your birth date and the group number that you are in? Your birth date and the group number. All right. I've got a glass. Let me use the glass. Okay, okay. You can stop. Everybody stop. Thank you. Lovely. Okay. So I've checked my instructions. Teaching online is a different skill with checking instructions. You always need to check your instructions when you're face to face and even more so 
when you're teaching online. So can you please all stop typing now? All right, you can stop there, no more. And I'm now going to share the Google Doc with you. So to do this, I need to copy the link into the chat box. And I'm also going to show you a QR code as well. So bear with me for one moment. I'm just going to go and find the link. Okay, the link is copied to the clipboard. I'm now going to back to the PowerPoint. And I'm going to share the link with you now. Can you click on the link and find and go to the document and start to type in the character adjectives to describe different family members? So the instructions are in your groups, think of different family members and adjectives to describe them. For example, my grandmother is kind. So my birthday is the 27th of April. I am in group four. I will write kind in group four. All right, here is the link. So you can all now start typing into this box. We've got friendly. Ooh. Okay, I'll type the link again. And I'll go back to the QR code. The QR code is there. Okay, because we're starting to get some nice. Just, just the adjective, that's all you need to type. Okay, 10 more seconds. Wow, you can see the activity that's going on in the board now. This is really great. Okay, but as we have, so maybe we have 448 participants, 
this is going to be uh, a little bit difficult to manage, right? But you imagine with a class of 25 or 30, um, something like this would be really nice to see. And students can see each other uh, working at the same time. And we also have a, a really nice uh, group of adjectives that we can then use uh, to facilitate our, our studying. All right, so you can stop that activity now. You've filled it all in very, very quickly. So uh, you can stop there. I'm interested to know um, about your family members. So as a follow-up, what we could do is, let me just go back to the PowerPoint. So as a follow-up to something, oops. As a follow-up to something like this, what we could then do with those adjectives is uh, then ask students to comment on the family members. So pick out an adjective and ask students to comment on which family members um, are um, linked to that adjective that they have described. Um, and another way you could do it is um, instead of having one document for the whole class is create four documents for four groups. Um, this, this obviously makes it a bit more intimate for those groups and it also um, stops people just from copying the other groups if students uh, are going to copy each other. So there are different ways that you can use these live documents, but they're quite exciting and, uh, and fun uh, for students to do. Yeah, now we have Mum is Beloved in the chat box there. So what we can do, what I can do is now pick out one of the adjectives that students have written and ask students then to type in family members. Great, so um, we've tried the Google Doc. So let's have a look now at how we can use Mentimeter as well. Now Mentimeter is a very uh, a useful tool. Um, we have the link there. This is the link to actually create um, your surveys. And then obviously when you're participating, you will go to Menti dot com and can we now have another go at this menti i'm going to show you a different uh, way of using mentimeter can you go to menti.com and type the code in there 36 24 51 and have a little vote on the adjectives to describe your family members All right, and I'm just going to new share again. The code is right here. Beautiful. All right. Look at kind right there, right in the middle. Kindness is a great quality, isn't it? Yeah. And imagine if you're a student and you're seeing this in the in, on your screen at home. It's really powerful. It's really beautiful to see that you're all creating these, these wonderful word clouds. They look great, and they're also useful in terms of the language. I have a nice, uh, while, we're, while we're just doing this, a really nice quote that I like to tell my daughter. It's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Okay, you can stop now. Let's go back. I think you get the idea. So word clouds are lovely, and you can then um, obviously, if you, even if you're teaching face to face, these are great to do for homework. Keep them open for a long time, and then post them on the wall. Um, and also, you can you can put them on the background of your <clears throat> excuse me of your uh, uh, your online setting as well. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So there's a couple of tools there that I've used. 
um, to show you how to brainstorm online. Now we're going to move on now to our vocabulary presentation. Now with any vocab presentation with kids, we're going to use a synchronous environment. So we're going to do it face to face. And we're going to use flashcards. So flashcards are very easy to use online. And you can do this as you would do uh, in the class, using physical cards, uh, showing them to the class. But the only problem is the drilling element. So checking of pronunciation. You say the word, the students repeat. In a face-to-face -face classroom, that's very easy. You get instant feedback. But problems occur when you want to do this um, online and when you want students to speak en masse. The microphone can get distorted. Uh, there can be a lag in time. So it can be a bit chaotic. You could single out participants um, and get them sort of to bring them up on stage. But this can take time and difficult to manage. And is it that effective to do that? Um, so I would just assume that the students are repeating the words by themselves. Make sure they've got the microphones off. You can actually turn them off. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a moment how we can actually check asynchronously the student's pronunciation. Another additional problem is that you also have to source the pictures uh, for the flashcards. And if you don't have them um, already with you, this can take time. Now, interactive software is great. And you usually, um, with inter interactive software, you usually have a bank of flashcards, whether they're in a resource center or actually in a presentation tool, ready to print in the resource center or in one place. And I'm gonna show you an example of a, a presentation tool now um, to use flashcards in the classroom. So just bear with me a moment while I share my screen again. So hopefully you can all see my uh, my my dashboard. This is the for Give Me Five Level Four, and it's a Navio, what we call Navio dashboard. And I'm going to go to Tap and Teach Lessons. These are the uh, the lessons that um, obviously I'm, I'm I'm going to be teaching, and they're faithful to the course book with the activities involved. So we're teaching vocabulary, and you can see here straight away I'm into the uh, flashcards. Now, lesson one vocabulary, starting the lesson. Now, I'm going to use my filter tool here because you'll see here, these are all the activities that I'm going to do in the course book. But for today, I just want to show you my flashcards. So if I click on flashcards at the top, I get my flashcards. Now, the first one starts the lesson. So this will introduce flashcards uh, or, or vocabulary that we've taught in a previous lesson to recap. And today we're going to present this new vocabulary. So here's my presentation. So if I click on this here, I have my flashcards that I'm going to be teaching. Now this tool is really cool because at the top I can decide if I want the full flashcard, a single flashcard and then showing the other flashcards at the bottom, or I can put them into a grid. Now I'll go to full. Now I also can hide everything. So here is the picture and here is the word. Or I can show the picture and hide the word. Or I can show the word and hide the picture. So it's really flexible and it's all in one place. So if I hide all and I click, we can see the image. And now I can get students either to type the word or get them to actually put their hand up and say the word if they, um, if they know the word. I can give them some practice. Tidy. Tidy. And we can flick through our flashcards. Untidy. Confident. Confident. So you can see how this presentation software, this, this tool that's provided by the by the course book is there and it's so effective in, in helping to uh, help your students online. Now, let me go back to my PowerPoint. So to check the pronunciation, how do we do this? Now we have to check the pronunciation asynchronously. 
So students need to have the audio so that they can listen first and then record themselves saying the list of words. Um, and then they can send it to the teacher. You will then check and select difficult words that students are having problems with to feedback on at the start of the next lesson. Now, there are a couple of things to remember here. Obviously, you need to have uh, a place to uh, store the recordings. They, students need to know where to send them to, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And also, they need to have the ability to be able to record themselves. They also need to have the audio. Um, so you need to think about where you can store the audio for the students. Time is an issue here, of, of course. If you do this for every set of vocabulary in the course book, you're going to be spending a lot of time listening to students saying words, and this is going to be difficult for you. So you need to be thinking about um, or selecting words. So within the, the 12 words that you're teaching, you can be sure that 10 of, oh, oh, five of those words, the students can say perfectly. You have to do some assuming on, on knowing your students and then selecting maybe just six words that they record and send to you to save time. And also, you might not do this for every set of words. You could also, if you have older students, is, uh, they might have issues. They may know that they have issues with certain areas of pronunciation and might be able to take more um, accountability, more responsibility, and find them for themselves and send them to you that way. Now, flashcards, while difficult to use to drill online to check pronunciation are very useful for checking understanding. So let's look how we can do this on the next page. So we can assume here that we have checked the understanding of our, um, our sorry, that, we can, that we've checked the pronunciation of our students um, and that they can say the words uh, effectively and clearly, but we want to make sure that they understand what the words mean. So to do this, we can write the words on the screen and give each word a number. So the students have already seen these flashcards, they've already been introduced to these words, um, and now we're just checking that they understand. So what we can now do is show an image, and in the chat box, the students will write down the number that corresponds to the image that I'm about to show you. So, what does the picture show? The words are listed on the left-hand side. Type the correct number into the chat box. So, are you ready? All right, well, here's the first picture. What number does it refer to? Yes, number four is correct. This is shy. And as I said, it's quite difficult. Yeah, good. It's quite difficult to, um, to actually show in an image some of these character adjectives. Um, and as I said, students will already have seen these images um, and we can check um, the understanding through that. Next one. What number? Yeah, this is number eight, unfriendly. The guy's obviously gone to shake her hand and she's just said, get out of town. Very unfriendly. Next one, quickly. Number nine, quiet, yeah. So you get the idea. So we would show these pictures and students can type into the chat box. So I'm just gonna flick through these now. I'm not gonna go through all of them because I'm conscious of time. And the same thing you can do by showing the words and this time showing, uh, showing the pictures and this time showing the words. Here we have students will now type into the chat box the corresponding number that goes to the picture. The only thing with these activities, while they're very interactive and they're fun, they can be time consuming to prepare. So just be conscious of that. 
Let me just flick through. Now let's look at the skills of listening. So we're going to look, listen, and sing. Here we're going to look at some asynchronous learning. So any listening or reading activities that are in the book can be done asynchronously. So students need access to the student's book, of course, and the audio files. And I mentioned earlier about coming up with an idea about how you're going to make them available. But they need to think, you need to think carefully about the task beforehand. How are you going to measure the participation? How can we, how can we be sure that when we give a task to a student asynchronously that they actually do the task? So here's an example. The students will listen and sing at home and they will get their mum or dad to listen and sing with them. They can record themselves and then they can either send it to a friend, the class, or the teacher. Now, here it's very important that we that students know what they're expected to do. Now, if we just tell them across the, the ether like we're doing now, you can be sure that some students will forget or some won't understand. So you need to create some kind of system or use an LMS, a learning management system like Edmodo, Class Dojo, or the, the school learning management system. You need to set up contact with the parents um, so that they're aware of what students have to do outside of the classroom. Now you can set up simple Google documents to do this, Google Sheets, um, or you can, um, you can use the learning management system. But which whether, whichever way you do, with teaching primary students, you need to get parental um, support and, and make sure that they're fully aware of what's going on so that everybody can participate. Again, vary the interaction pattern. Don't just send it to a friend. Don't just send it to the class or the teacher. Mix it up. And this is important to you so that they're not just sending everything to you. Um, guidelines are important. Also for, for child protection and safety, you need to make sure that you have a secure space that people can send their, their their work to. Now the last thing we'll look at is the reading activity and how you can uh, take this online. So we can have what we call asynchronous input, so students read the task um, at home, and then the synchronous checking, they can um, come to the classroom. And what I would do as a teacher with this activity is I would probably read this to the students uh, so that, first of all, they can have a look at the pronunciation of some of the key words. Um, if I have presentation software, I would show them or, or play the presentation software to, uh, to help them uh, with that uh, pronunciation. And then to check, I would do a correct the mistake activity. So with this activity, I would read it to them, but they cannot see the text. They would close their books. And to make sure that they're not cheating, I'd ask them to put their books on their heads. Then I will read the text to them and I will make mistakes. When they hear a mistake, they will write stop in the chat box and they will correct the mistake. So this is a nice way, correct the teacher um, and a nice way of checking that they've read the, uh, the text that I want them to. I can check that they've done this, uh, obviously, by either them taking photographs or showing me their, their workbooks, actually putting up to the camera that they've actually done the, the work that I've asked them to do online. And then we can check the answers together. Now, we have this uh, asynchronous student-centered uh, teaching as well, using an interactive software tool called Navio. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you this because I'm, I'm very wary of time and we want to have a Q&A. So let me just share my screen one more time. We'll go back to our Navio. And I just want to show you this really cool tool. So our unit is what are you like? So this this is something that students can do at home and it's, it's faithful to the course book so all the activities match what we've been doing in the course book so if i jump on here 
you will see there are activities that I can do or that my students can do that are much to the course book. So they have to look at the images and pull well, we can check that students have done these these kind of activities. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to give you an idea of what they can do. They can select, close that. They can they select where they go in this world. And jump on and listen to the stories and do activities as they go through the course book. So you can see it's a really cool, useful tool. And what I want to stress is have a look at your course book. Whatever course book you're using, have a look and make sure that if you have the interactive software, that you're actually using that interactive software because it will save you time and it will save you energy. Okay, now for any other online resources for teaching online, we have some cool links here. We've got the Macmillan English Distance and Teaching Learning Hub. And I've also put together a, a, a group of links that I've used uh, for webinars and for online resources and for free online courses. If you want any more information from Macmillan in Vietnam, you can contact the email here. And if you would like to contact me, then please don't hesitate. I'm very happy to hear from you. And we'll be sharing these PowerPoints with you. So if you don't catch this right now, don't worry. You can see it later. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much to VUS for organizing this webinar, which I think is a really great initiative. Such a shame that we can't be there in person, but hey, if the world gives you lemons, let's make lemonade. And um, I'm really proud and happy to be a part of this uh, and continue uh, the relationship with uh, VUS and all the teachers here in Vietnam. So thank you once again to you all for, your, for listening to me on this, uh, this Wednesday morning. And uh, I hope to see you all in person very soon when this stops. Thanks, Larry. Um, now let's come to the Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type in the Q&A box. Okay, I see there is one question already there for you, Derek. Ah, so I'm assuming, okay, so what should you do if students erase or change the content instruction? So I'm assuming this is in the Google Doc. Um, so I think what you just need to be, what you need to be is just be careful. Make sure that you're monitoring, monitoring at the time. Maybe you could change the uh, the color of instruction and make sure that students know not to uh, not to change anything um, that they shouldn't do. Now for this question, that's that's a good question. But um, do you have online classes? I would suggest that you contact the Vietnam team. Um, at the email on the previous slide. Now, and that, how to motivate students. Now, how do you motivate students in your classes face to face? I don't think you need to differentiate too much. I think you need to be available for your students. I think you need to make your lessons engaging as much as possible, uh, make your lessons fun, and show that you're there and that you care for your students. You're still the same teacher, whether you're face to face in the same room as them or online. I hope you know, that you can still pro, uh, project that you care and you want your students to develop and motivate them in that way. So asynchronous is basically offline. So it's what you would do between your classes. Synchronous is online, live teaching over the internet. Uh, Navio is, there are other products that go with uh, Navio. And again, Susan, have a, have a uh, send an email to the Macmillan team in Vietnam and they can give you uh, lots of information about that. Menti.com, just go to 
mentimeter.com. You need to probably set up, register an account, and then you can start creating your own brainstorms from there. And again, um, I'm probably not going to be able to answer all of these, but um, differentiation in studying online is a good question. Um, and I think it's something that um, we, we need to be careful about, right? You need to be able to monitor your students. So um, if, you're, if, if you know you, your students already, you can, you can have some idea um, of which students are, are finding it easy to keep up and which aren't. Um, you just need to, to create a dialogue. So get in, the, get in a private chat with your students or with the parents. Initially, it's, you're going to be spending more time. And I think that is why teachers are, are telling me that they're exhausted because there's a lot more to it than just getting on the camera and teaching. Um, normally, if you have a student that's falling about behind, you can just keep them behind and talk to them and give them some extra work. It's difficult. It's hard to pick that up. I appreciate that. But I would just... Uh, use the same kind of tools and keep an open dialogue with parents. Okay. Let me have a look. I'm just scrolling down. There's lots of questions. Okay, with time wasting, with awkward silence. I think that's something you get used to, right? I, I, I often find it difficult, particularly in, in a session like today, where I'm talking to the screen and I'm not getting any feedback um, apart from the chat box. I'm not uh, really, um, I, I can't adjust my presentation to the room because I can't see the room. Um, awkward silence, wasting time for waiting. You can put up a clock. Um, so that students can, uh, uh, you know, can, can work towards the clock and see if that helps. Um, and also you can embrace the silence. You can tell them, okay, we're going to be quiet for a moment. Um, and, and that's fine. Or for, for one minute, I want you to sit in silence and think. That, again, is fine. Manage that silence and own that silence. Um, I also think, actually, it's a good idea with anything, possibly with a lesson, of an hour with primary students, you need to have breaks. You need to get them to stand up, move around, exercise for uh, 30 seconds and come back and sit back down again. This is important. It's important for you and it's important for the students as well. Okay. Other activities. My, my advice with the uh, presentation tools, such as the technology stuff, the Google Docs, the Menti, these are great. They enhance your learning. But really, um, some the, the activities that you see in your course book, I would just advise you, and again, it's about time, to sit down and plan your lesson as you would do in the classroom, but have an eye on how you're going to uh, move this across to teaching online. So if you're doing the normal activities that you do in class, just keep asking yourself, is this going to work online? If no, then don't do it. Ask yourself, can the students do this by themselves with some support? If the answer is yes, get them to do it by themselves. You need to be there for um, providing motivation, to providing interest, and also providing a live model. Um, you need to be there to, to motivate students to work together um, and, and you know, building that, that classroom environment. So just think about it when you're actually planning your lesson as you would do normally, what would work online, what wouldn't. Derek, we have a time for one or two more questions. Now this, okay, thank you. Um, the only thing I would consider is um, they might need a bit more support with the technical aspects of things. But as I said earlier, kids, have grown up with technology now. Even kindergarten children have the ability to, to use technology at some, in some respects. Now, you would want the parents to be there, obviously. If you're teaching kindergarten, you want the parents to, to be there and to, um, to be able to manage the child anyway in a room on their own. So they're going to have parental support. If you're teaching 
say primary one, you probably need a bit of parental support as well. And mums and dads are likely going to be in the room and should be able to help you. This is where you need to have uh, uh, clear um, avenues of um, or conduits where you talk to the uh, talk to the parents directly and let them know exactly what you want to achieve and what you're trying to do. You need to, as I said earlier, find out what technology they actually have already and whether they are microphones, whether they have uh, headphones, whether they have webcams, this kind of thing. So you know exactly which students can do which activities. Initially, it takes time, it takes energy, but it will help you in the future. I think you can teach any level, beginner to uh, advanced online. Okay, um, I think we have a lot more questions here, but we don't have enough time to answer all of them. Uh, sorry guys, but um, we will have, I, I believe that you guys will find the answer to your questions in our upcoming webinars. We have about like five more to come in the, in the next week and the week after that. Um, so uh, thanks Derek and thanks Ong for joining today. We hope that you enjoy our webinar and uh, we'll be able to apply the ideas to your teaching practice. Before you finish, uh, please be reminded of the following things. Um, I'm going to share the I'm going to share the links for you to download your uh, certificate and the link to uh, uh, do the, the online survey for our webinar.